episode was recorded during the two-day multi-stakeholder dialogue on gender equality and sustainable development, jointly organized by Parl Americas, UN Women Multi-Country Office in the Caribbean, and the Parliament of St. Lucia and Gros LA St. Lucia. In this presentation, Dr. Rosina Wiltshire, Gender and Development Specialist, shares on key themes and interlinkages of gender equality and sustainable development, reinforcing the message that these goals can only be achieved in partnership and through the application of holistic, human-centered framework where human beings are placed at the center of national analysis, policy framework, and programs. Dr. Wiltshire explores the opportunities for transforming Caribbean societies and the world by extension, using the models and foundations of gender equality, peace, and resilience. She neatly explains key gender concepts and their relationship to transformational leadership. Dr. Wiltshire also presents ways in which these themes can be effectively reflected in intergovernmental processes like the International Conference on Small Island Developing States and within national processes and decision-making. The fourth Small Island Developing States Conference will be held in Antigua and Barbuda next year in the context of increasing violence and impacts of climate change, which threaten to completely derail the global community, the global gains, the gains of small island states, and their sustainability. I wish to reinforce the message which emerged from our discussions. A gender perspective of small island developing states can only be successfully approached from a holistic human-centered framework where human beings are at the center of the analysis, policy framework, and programs. The women's movement sought to bring from early that holistic and gender-based lens to the debates, policy, and programs on sustainable development. That holistic and gender perspective identified the connections between violence beginning in the household and spiraling out to communities, nations, and the global community. It further connects the endemic violence, gender-based violence, and violence against the earth. It's no accident that we talk about Mother Earth. It's also directly linked to poverty, inequality within and among nations, social and economic instability and environmental degradation. I know that many of you are aware of what gender is, but our colleague from the Bahamas talked about not being able to even use the word. So I just want to take us back through what gender means. Gender is often confused with sex. Sex is biological, male, female, intersex. Intersex is born with both organs. Often both organs may not be present, but the dominant chromosomes may be contrary to the physical presentation. I remember many, many moons ago, it was in 1968 when I went to France to teach. Uh, one of the teachers, I was teaching high school and one of the teachers invited me to her home. Her husband was a lawyer. They had this beautiful girl and um, who was about two, three. I love children. So we bonded and she wanted to go to the bathroom and I said, let me take her. And the parents stiffened and then they said, okay. And I had no idea. I saw a penis and a vagina, it was like, and, but I was like, okay. I went back out and they said, she was born this way. We wanted a girl, so we dressed as a girl. She, and the doctor said, we will do the operation when she is a little older. I think of that girl. When I hear people talk about God made man and woman, 
um, because I don't know if she determined that she was really a girl or if she wanted to be a boy, but I do know that God made every human being and there is diversity in humanity. Gender, on the other hand, is a social construct related attitudes, values, roles and responsibilities and behaviors, which society determines appropriate for males and females. And this varies over societies and time. A dramatic example of the shift in gender over time took place in Europe in the 15th century. Between the years 1300 and 1500, women in Germany participated in more than 200 professions, including being doctors, I mean, they were scientists, agriculturalists, they were in every, every spectrum of human endeavor. However, women's status fell dramatically and social attitudes about what were appropriate roles and behaviors of women in Europe and North America changed radically with the witch hunts, which began in the early 15th century and lasted almost 300 years. Women leaders and scientists were almost wiped out in the witch hunts in Europe, with Germany alone executing almost 7,000 women. Historians estimate that there were approximately 100,000 formal trials of alleged witches and 50,000 executions in Europe. The actual numbers are likely to be much greater because most of the records were lost over the centuries and citizens often carried out their own executions and burnings, which were not recorded. The records exist, however, which exist, show that several thousand women were executed and many more persecuted and put to trial. In the book, A World Without Women, the researcher documents that one village in France was left with only three women. Men who supported or defended the women were also persecuted and many executed. If we don't understand our history, we do not understand why we are here and where we need to go in order to achieve peace and sustainability and just respect for every human being. The systematic attack on women at all levels marked a period of retreat of women from public life and their confinement to the home in Europe and the US. The notion that women should stay at home and be protected by men was based on the real threat to women's lives during that time. However, that notion that women's place is in the home also reinforce the systematic attempt to control and subordinate women. In British common law, women and children were deemed the property of men and subordinate to men. This system also obtained in the USA. Shifts to reduce women's status also took place in Africa and Asia. Before the colonial era in several countries in Africa and Asia, women were equal participants in leadership. Before the dominant, colonial ethic established the male patriarchal system of women as subordinate and unfit for leadership as a dominant model. In Turkey, there were women scientists and doctors. When Western higher educational institutions, institutions were not admitting women into the sciences and medicine. The horror and violence of the persecution, assault and massacre, of countless women over centuries, with men, women, and children witnessing their mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters tortured, violated, and murdered because they were visible, active, and knowledgeable, have led to a collective amnesia. We talk about women being in the home as historical. It's not. This amnesia 
has perpetrated the myth commonly held that women were always in the home and only in modern times have begun to demand that they take their place in public life and leadership position. While forgetting may shield us from the horror and trauma of that violence of the past, the danger of forgetting is that we fail to learn the lessons of the past and risk repeating them. There is no doubt that the dominant patriarchal model is now shifting to a greater recognition of women as equal human beings across the world, formalized in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was proclaimed in the UN in 1948 after the Second World War. However, women's equality and equal rights remains a slow progress process. Regrettably, there's regression in many countries, including the Arab world and the USA. And in the Caribbean, we are having these discourses about, you know, this thing being imposed, this equality story being imposed from abroad. Now, gender identity is different from gender or sex. Gender identity refers to an individual's personal sense of self which can be male, female, or a spectrum, which may or may not have any relationship to the person's biological sex. Gender equality signifies giving equal value to traditionally defined masculine and feminine roles, attitudes, roles, and behavior assigned to men. Caring, compassion, empathy, today regarded as feminine traits are essential to every balanced human being, men and women, boys and girls, and those across the spectrum, and essential to peace. Sustainable development is development which puts people first, recognizing that we are one human family and earth is our home. Building peace, beginning with ourselves and each child, Begin, building peace in the home is essential to health, social and political stability, economic vitality and sustainability. Violence, hierarchy and self-service rather than service to others are endemic to patriarchy which unfortunately is still our dominant model. This violence, control over others and greed, destroys households, communities, societies, and the environment. The per per pervasive domestic and global violence, which threaten to destroy our societies and the world, are a direct result of a patriarchal order, which glorifies violence. Boys are taught that aggression is manly. In a study that I led as CARICOM gender ad advocate across the region, interviewing young boys and girls across the school system, the boys said that they, if they try to walk away from a fight, they are laughed at by the girls and the boys. They cannot, they're taught that they have to suppress their emotions. They can't hug, they can't cry because that is not manly. And this is, I'm talking about babies, boys. Well, the people I interviewed, the children I interviewed were from 12 to 18. But um, I know that we are still telling our little children that, oh, be a man. Don't, don't be so girlish. If they come and try to hug, they're pushed away. The result is a lack of self-control and violence beginning in the home. Because if they can't express their emotions, if they can't develop that caring, compassionate side of themselves, what we get are unbalanced human beings whose emotions are going to be expressed in unnatural and violent ways. 
the impact of violence on small states is multiplied. In the, in the Caribbean, slavery reinforced the violent model with women's bodies used to reproduce the enslaved population. So we are dealing with a double kind of reinforced violent framework. And we are surprised that our societies are so violent, our boys are so violent, that so many of them end up in prison. It is endemic to our the way that we operate and the way we treat the boys and the girls. And we are surprised because the grandmothers, the communities to help them hold and are no longer there, the churches. So we are going to get, a continue to get an explosion of violence if we do not act. Small size provides opportunities and dangers. There are opportunities for SIDS transformational change because of size and scale. Strategic initiatives can show dramatic positive impacts and results. Small size also presents significant dangers to small island states because of the amplified impacts of violence, global crises, and environmental degradation because of the size and scale. While we tend to focus on the dangers posed by small size, the opportunities for transforming our societies and the world provide the possibility for building our societies as models of peace, sustainable development, and resilience. We can do it. The Caribbean has produced global leaders in economics, culture, and innovation. Two Nobel Prize winners have come from this country. Arthur, so Arthur Lewis in economics and Derek Walcott in literature. From a country with less than 200,000 people. Bob Marley of Jamaica continues to influence the world with his music, as does Rihanna of, of Barbados. And music can change attitudes, behaviors, across the world. We have power that we are not understanding and using. Calypso, Carnival and Steel Pan were developed in Trinidad. Steel Pan has unfortunately now been patented in the US. Oliver Headley, and we talk about our economic potential, we, we have the potential, we, but we don't value what we have. Oliver Headley of Barbados led the innovation in solar energy and presented the model of alternative energy in 1981 in Nairobi at the UN Conference on New and Renewable Sources of Energy at the NGO Forum, where I had the privilege of, which I had the privilege of attending. Claudia Jones of Trinidad was a global leader in the struggle for workers' rights and gender equality with citizens as far as Japan, demonstrating when she was imprisoned for, in the US for her political adv advocacy. When she was deported to Britain, she started the beauty pageants to showcase black beauty, and she started the Notting Hill Carnival to showcase kind of Caribbean culture. If we don't know where we are coming from, if we don't know what the, show, the foundation on which we can build, we will think we have to start from scratch over and over again. Claudia Jones is buried to Karl Marx, next to Karl Marx in England. How many of us know of Claudia Jones? Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore adopted the Arthur Lewis economic model of development, making that country one of the most successful countries economically, globally. Desmond Tutu visited Trinidad at, to see firsthand a model of a society in which people of different races, ethnicities, and religion lived together in relative harmony and thrive. Where are we now? As I said, I had the privilege, but let me say, 
we have a lot to build on. I, I'm an optimist, as you can see. I've been at this for a long time. I had the privilege of attending the UN Conference on New and Renewable Sources of Energy in Nairobi in 1981 and briefing Caribbean delegates before their participation on sense and gender issues. I say, wow. Barbados, Oliver Headley, as I said, presented there, demonstrating the potential of solar energy for addressing the challenges posed by fossil fuels. I'm talking about 1981. The global consensus at that meeting was, well, not even at that meeting. Well, <laughs> I should say, I still reflect. Eric Williams said he did, it was a conference of heads our Trinidad Prime Minister said, oil don't spoil, so he don't have to be there. And, um, and uh, 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 Siagar of Jamaica got up at that conference and promoted the idea of nuclear energy as the way of the future. It was like, all right. Um, but the global consensus at that conference was that oil was still cheap and solar would be too expensive. So while Barbados introduced incentives to its population for installing solar heating, there was little wider Caribbean buy-in. We often tend to give more value to foreign advisors and what is developed abroad than what we have here. The Caribbean missed a major opportunity for global leadership and economic development and sustainability in this critical area. At the same 1981 conference in Nairobi, Wangari Matai, with whom I had the pleasure of working, she was Kenyan and leader of the Green Belt Movement, brought hundreds of women from the rural areas to speak to the heads of government. The women, most of whom were barefooted, stood outside the Nairobi Conference Center and spoke to the few heads who came to listen. They spoke of having to walk further and further for firewood and water. And the fact that something was happening to the weather and the earth. This is 1981. They were speaking of climate change and its impacts on their lives and their families. Because of gender roles, because the women are the ones who went to collect the firewood and the water, they experienced the growing impact of these climatic changes. But because they were women, their message was ignored. They were not scientists. They were not wealthy industrialists whose voices held sway. In 1991, so I fast forward 10 years, the leaders of all the major religions, including the Catholic, Anglican, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, what? Russian Orthodox gathered in Geneva at the Proprietary Conference for the UN, Proprietary UN Conference on Environment and Development in preparation for the Rio Conference to be held. They sought to bring a spiritual perspective to the care of the earth. They were all male and invited the development alternatives with women, Dawn, of whom Peggy Anthropos was a co-founder, and of whom I was the focal point for environment and development of Dawn. So I was designated to join the men to come up with what emerged as the Earth Charter. How many of you have heard of the Earth Charter? The Earth Charter was presented, well, at Tomori Strong at the Rio conference in Brazil at which I also had the privilege of attending. But the Earth Charter reminds us, it begins that we are one human family and the Earth is our home. And we are risking our global family, the survival of the global family with the destruction of the Earth. The Charter identifies respect and care for the community of life, democracy, nonviolence and peace social and economic justice and ecological integrity as the four major priority plans. It is online, you can 
The charter was not officially endorsed by the heads in Rio, but became a core advocacy tool of civil society organizations seeking to monitor and advocate for a more sustainable policy agenda. I also happened to serve on the advisory team on gender to the Secretary General of that UNSED conference, who was Maurice Strong. And with the leadership of, so we, we put out a book, in fact, <laughs> which was published, Women and Children First, because women and children are last in the present global order. But under, with the leadership of Bella Abzug, I don't know, Bella, one of the first women in the US Congress and a real powerhouse. I became a member of the International Planning Action Committee, which convened the first, the women, World Women's Congress for a Healthy Planet in Miami in November, 1991, attended by over 1500 women representing every region of the world from over 80 countries. The outcome document, Women's Agenda 21, was presented to Maurice Strong and at the conference. And I would say that many of the recommendations were integrated into the UN Conference on Environment and Development, Agenda 21, which emerged in Rio. And these documents are now online. In those days, we were with paper and giving out all. This is, now you go online, you click. They remain relevant. Since we're recognized as a special case for environment and development at that conference in Rio. And the conference took place in 1992. I also happened, I had the privilege of participating in the first sit conference in Barbados in 1994. Y'all must be asking, how old are you, woman? <laughs> I'm 77. I'm still going. <laughs> But <laughs> there's so much work to do. But I, I'm, 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 when I, I'm really inspired by this meeting because I said to somebody, something shifting. We have been, you know, the, for me, it's doing the work and letting go of the result because I'm not in charge. Damnita always said, you know who is the boss. You do what you have to do and let go. <laughs> So I'm serving the boss, the one upstairs. Hi, hi, upstairs. <laughs> um, but the creator is the inspiration. And we, uh, we all are part of creation. So I, I said, participated in the first conference, which concluded with the SIDS conference here in Barbados, the Barbados Program of Action. I was also part, because the pe people tend to deal with these things in, in silos. I also had the privilege of being part of the Secretary General's team planning the 1995 Beijing Conference on Women, Peace and Development. And I participated in drafting the Beijing Platform for Action, which set the broader framework. The sustainability, end of violence, in the home, of survival, economic, all these things, bio, all these things are connected. They are not separate. So when we lose the plot, we actually lose our way. I further attended, so, I also was supported and a lot of the participation globally of women in Beijing. And really, I know we 
that was a landmark. We, I further attended the Mauritius conference and supported Caribbean participation in the second SIDS conference from which the Mauritius strategy emerged. The Barbados Program of Action identified Agenda 21 as a comprehensive document within which it should be interpreted. The Program of Action and Mauritius cited, all of them cite one another, but we forget what the citing is about. So the Barbados Program of Action says, the Rio Declaration identifies human beings as being at the center of concern for sustainable development. Development in initi initiatives in SIDS should be seen in both the needs and aspirations of human beings and the res their responsibility towards present and future generations. It talks about survival of SIDS being firmly rooted, rooted in the human resources and cultural heritage and all efforts being made to ensure the centrality of people in the process, the importance of women's participation in the decision-making. But it says sustainable development must seek to enhance the quality of life of people, including all people, their health, well-being, and safety. Full attention must be given to gender equity and the important role and contribution of women, as well as the needs of women and other major groups, including children, youth, indigenous people, the disabled. So when Mauritius reaffirms that, when some more pathway reaffirm that, and we come down to the 14 point program, which is important, the natural, climate change, sea level rise, waste management, coastal and marine resources, freshwater resources, energy resources, tourism resources, bio we, we, we tend to, we come to the, to the pieces and we get fixated on the pieces, which are all important, but we forget the foundation which binds those pieces together. So it is important so my so while the areas are important, they are symptomatic of deeper ills. All the symptoms, as I said, are interconnected and have common roots. It is therefore an exercise in futility to attempt to address them without addressing the foundational issues and without talking about gender equality and the importance of reshaping, changing the culture of patriarchy, which Justice Jamada talked about. Without dealing, I, you know, I see it as, I said, if you deal with the symptoms alone and forget what, the, what is the root of the symptoms, it's like trying to eliminate cholera by focusing on the diarrhea and the dehydration. Without dealing with the root causes of the contaminated water, the epidemic worsened and millions continued to die. When they went to the source, they stopped the cholera. The same is true of the present path of climate change and increasing violence, including violence against women with a major impact, not just for SIDS, but the entire global community. The reality is that the impacts of gender equality inequality are central to the challenges and its resulting violence contaminate the entire fabric of societies, deeply impact the value systems which drive all attitudes, behaviors, and the social, economic, political, judicial, and environmental outcomes that we seek to address. So while I come back to Wangari, who, I mean, while Wangari, I, I said she got the Nobel Peace Prize in spite of the, well, while Wangari led the Green Belt Movement to replace the loss of forest and biodiversity, and she was passionate about replanting. She also sought to challenge the broader systems that she identified as driving the environmental degradation. 
She advocated locally and globally against violence for the equality of women and gender equality. And she, the violence which destroys communities, the environment, and the mass destruction of forests. Wangari was imprisoned for her advocacy. And she was imprisoned while Bella and we were planning the, the um, Women's World Women's Congress. And we all said, no way. So we organized globally and said, she has to be released. So Wangari was released, <laughs> but, and as I said, eventually, but we lobbied. We, we knew we, can't, we could not act alone. So we've acted locally and globally, joining hands with men, with everybody who shares the goals, because women are only half of the world. Men are the other half. Men are our brothers. Men are our fathers. Men are our children. So we cannot, this is not a boys versus girls, men versus women story. This is, we are all one family and we will sink or swim together. As I said, Mangari got the Nobel Peace Prize for her work, I think the first African woman. But it is important to, when we are building that building peace and we are coming to these, we are having these conferences. It has to begin with ending gender-based violence as a key action agenda. We can't just list the environmental areas and say, and gender equality, okay? That doesn't work. Gender-based violence is one of the sig most significant connecting indicators to ill health, loss of productivity, destruction of the social and environmental fabric of society and sustainability. And it is incompatible with sustainable development. Violence in the home manifests most often in gendered ways. So you have the girls, the sexual abuse, the physical, the um, emotional, while the boys are most likely to experience emotional and physical abuse. Because when we tell somebody, don't cry, that's emotional abuse. When we say, don't hug, that's emotional violence. And then when you hear, because of all of the anger and violence, you're just like your father. <laughs> which, is, which is not often not said as a, <laughs> as a governor. <laughs> <laughs> and it is usually preceded by the worthless. <laughs> Anyhow, I digress. <laughs> but I'm serious. Our be we are part of the problem and we are absolutely part of the solution. So, as I said, the socialization of boys has to change. Uh, they are also taught that they have to show sexual prowess as a mark of their manhood. And we say, oh my God, there's such a high level of teenage pregnancy. Not only the boys are making the girls pregnant, it's big men too. But we are not connecting the dots. We are not connecting the dots. So this violence, the boys, when they hit out, they, they, they hit out at their peers. So we had statistics about man-to-man -man violence. It's all connected. But yet we seek to build more prisons, put more police, more metal detectors. We are not dealing with the root and spending endless money wasted. Embedding a gender perspective into the sense, discussions and outcome documents is essential if the SIDS meeting in Antigua and Barbuda is likely to have a major impact. Agenda 21 and the Women's Action Agenda provide, as I said, an important 
Foundation. The recommendations call, as I said, for reducing violence and the greater involvement of women in decision-making, which have to be repeated and acted upon. Addressing the foundation of violence and reshaping the foundation of peace is an essential point for transformation and sustainability. This requires actions which build on good practice. The education sector and educational reform are priority. Integrating core values, human values of peace, love, honesty, self-control into our educational system is essential to building healthy, peaceful children, homes, and societies. We're educating people, children to pass exams, not be, to become good human beings and citizens of the world. Nor all good fathers, parents, children, we're not, we, we are, we have to re, re, un, reinvest in our children. So I said, let's, they're tried. We want to build happy, healthy, kind, productive citizens who care for one another and the earth. Partnerships are essential, including private sector and the faith-based communities. They have tried models for strengthening women's participation in decision-making, and we need to act on it. Ghana has a 30, uh, 30 I think, you know, somebody said we are like in, in the molasses. I went around the world trying to get countries, beginning with countries like Rwanda, Burundi, South Africa. I worked with Nelson Mandela and his team saying, you have to make 30% of your team women. And at first Mandela said, no way. Well, um, and then he said, yeah, let's do it. South Africa was the first in Africa to introduce the 30% um, female. And all over the world, they have now built on that model. Countries like Rwanda, Burundi, and Rwanda we see doing brilliantly dealing with economic development, COVID, addressing COVID. And we, we, in the Caribbean, they said, oh, but women are doing so well. Look at all the women. Ship. We were the first to have your junior charge. We don't need a quota. We don't need temporary special measures. It's like the tortoise and the hare. We are being left behind at our peril. Um, last week, I'm an optimist. <laughs> so, so last week, I was part of a group. Um, the such as their models of integrating human values in education across the world and in 120 countries. And the Satya Sai uh, group uh, led the conference in Barbados of educators. We had 250 educators in the room from all over the region and some from Latin America and the rest of the world, and 600 people online about what is working in this model of integrating human values into the educational system. Peace, love, honesty, self-control, right action. The models the, the 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 conference. I mean, it was beautiful to hear from the children. We had the the virtual, some of whom because they were thrown out of schools because they were bad book children, who are, you know, one child said, I came from, a, you know, the ghetto, and I was discarded by the system, but I learned to understand the importance of caring and kindness and love and to show one and myself and others, regardless of religion, this is not about religion, regardless of race, regardless of whether they were rich or poor. And now I, he became one of the first graduates in his household. 
He said, I would have been in prison. And there were several stories from Africa. It, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We had, educational reform is key. Yes, we heard about the importance of providing early child care. Let us stop educating our children for to pass exams, cramming their heads with information rather than pulling out the beauty and the love. The information will get in when they are balanced and happy. So let us begin at the foundation with changing the patriarchal model to build cultures of peace. The school, we can't, we can work with the parents. In fact, what happens is that when the children go home and say to the parent, oh, this is what I learned, the parents actually learn from the children. So the households begin to change. So I will end by saying, as I said, sustainability, the Caribbean, well, let me, they are tried and tested models for, F, for the participation, for educating for peace and the Caribbean SIDS, which led the world, we are now trailing. We need to act on good practice and sustainability can only be achieved within a holistic framework with building peace and gender equality as foundational elements Strengthening women's participation, which we agreed upon in Beijing, remains a key imperative. Let us build on the, great, the, the, the good practices. And somebody talked about women being afraid. My experience is that women step forward once they, have, they know that there's a possibility of them getting in. And I saw it in India. I saw it across the world. I, I said, I've worked in, in some of the rural Indian country where you know, initially the, the, the men put their wives, but afterwards it was like, hey, the woman can actually lead. So it's what we talk about is a context in which women don't feel that they have an equal chance. So, you know, why expose themselves to all the abuse? and the, But if they feel that they have even a fighting chance, a one third chance, the women step forward. So really introducing this temporary special measures. Let's do it. Transforming the judicial cultures we heard and building a post patriarchal judicial culture in integrity as she, uh, Justice Jamadas is essential. Gender budgeting talked about by my sister. <laughs> um, that's key. How does a budget, I mean, why is it that the educational sector, we talk about women in in, in getting not the men not being in education. The educational sector gets one of the smallest pieces of the budget. The health sector, we build hospitals, but salaries, not so much, not so much. All right, <laughs> we build the buildings, all right? So what are our priorities? What, when we look at the budget, who benefits? from the allocations. We put a lot of money into security, a lot of money. That's picking up the pieces after the vase has fallen, the damage is done. So, and one of the, as I said, I also had the privilege of working with Nelson Mandela. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things he accepted, they accepted when they got into power was we, I gave, um, provided a gender budget specialist to help them because they understood how race had affected the allocation of the budget because black schools and black, you know, areas, but they didn't get the, so to help them to understand the gender implications of the budgetary allocations. Um, I, Debbie Blender who worked with them is still alive, I gather, and, do, and working hard, but the gender budgeting is key. How does this allocation affect every sector, men and women, rural, urban, you know, the, all of the pieces, 
So it's holistic. The, 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 the disabled, how, 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 how is the budget impacting human beings? We have to start with the human beings, not with the figures. So I will end by saying, let us begin with ourselves because we tend to point fingers. It's the politicians, it's the judges, it's the boys, it's the boys on the block, it's a drug bird. Everybody has, is a problem. And the private sector has to, to be part of it. I was really pleased to hear of that banking example because we're all in this together. It's not about making money at the expense, short-term gain, long-term pain, because we all, as I said, we all go down together. So let us begin with ourselves. Modeling, kindness, peace, respect for every human being and acting in integrity. Behavior change is called for and we must begin with ourselves. I thank you.